Hello everybody and welcome to Chicago Reacts. My name is Lauren and today we are going to be reacting to Internet Historian's Man in a Cave. Uh, this is a long one, so strap in folks, get your drinks ready and set, and we are going to play a game today wherein if Lauren says something stupid, take a drink. And I'll also be taking a drink when I say something stupid. We're all playing this together and we'll see how the video goes from that. Uh, before we get going for real though, let me just welcome everybody in again. Thank you for joining us for the first time. If you've never been here before, thank you for joining us again, if you have been. Uh, we do appreciate any likes, comments, subscriptions, all of that really helps us out so much. Um, and if you do feel it in your heart to become a Patreon, we'd appreciate that as well. Uh, and now without further ado, let's get into Man in a Cave from Internet Historian. I am not sure what to expect from this, uh, but let us go. All right. Uh, this, uh, adjust the screen's brightness until the text on the left is barely visible. I think that's probably fine. Follows satire and journalism. In the state of Kentucky, there is a cave oh. that every now and then demands a sacrifice. Okay. January 30th, 1925. A man walks towards the cave with a kerosene lamp in his hand. He hangs up his jacket and ducks into a five-foot opening. The inside of the cave is narrow. He has to drop down on his hands and knees, crawling through a passageway filled with jagged rocks and choking dust. Then down a chute he had cleared out months earlier. Okay. So All of the this. daylight is gone from here, and this lantern is his only source of light. Ignoring the loose limestone rocks perched directly above him, he is now 100 feet in, and here he reaches the turnaround room. Now they call this the turnaround room because this is the juncture where even experienced cavers say no thanks and turn around. Because to continue on means going through this, the squeeze, a gap in the stone of only nine inches. For reference, here's a subway sub. Going through he would look exactly like this. His arms will need to be completely at their side and he will need to exhale so that he can reduce the size of his torso. Gradually, bit by bit, he disappears into the hole. Yo, I'm not even claustrophobic, but like, that would mess me up. Also, I, <laughs> I think I'm more than nine inches wide up and down so I wouldn't fit anyway, but like, oh my God. Oh, like my heart is actually in my throat right now just thinking about it, holy shit. His clothes are caught on sharp gypsum crystals, hooking into him and threatening to hold him in place. But using his feet like paddles, he pushes through. He reaches a wider opening at the other side then crawls forward towards a ledge. Illuminated here is a 10-foot drop. A rope is already secured around a boulder. Wait, which they, they got a picture of the real guy? A wider opening at the other side. So somebody else is... How did they get that photo? If that's the real person, how did they get that? then crawls forward towards a ledge. Also, there Illuminated here guy is there a 10 like foot drop. A rope is already secured around a boulder, which allows him to rappel down. His worn out leather shoes touch the ground. This is as far as he can go, and it is time for work to begin. What he is working on is another opening. At the moment, it's too small for anyone to fit through but he will chip away at it until he can shove himself right through the other side. Because on the other side is this. Oh. A magnificent and otherworldly cave structure that will be irresistible to tourists. 
Yeah, it looks like a mouth. Look at that, yo. It looks like you got teeth up at the top and fangs and shit at the bottom. You got like, this looks like a tongue. That looks, that looks like a s giant skull. Oh, that is cool. How did he find that in the first place? <laughs> Why did he decide to go down there? <laughs> How do you discover that b by accident? Every day for months, he has been removing rocks from this crevice. To him, the other thing any bigger? this is all just routine. So he eases further into the gap. Carefully, he contorts his body through. Rocks compress the sides of his torso, so close that his arms are pinned to the side of his body. He once again paddles his feet to inch down. Then, about halfway, he stops. Hmm. The lantern, it's starting to dim. He will need to go all the way back to the surface to refuel the thing. He sighs. He slowly shuffles back out, pushing the lantern with his shoulder. Then, oh no, ding, crack, darkness. He has knocked over the lamp and it has broken. Now the man didn't panic. He had been caught in the dark before and he could make his way back by feel alone. So he continues worming out, leveraging his foot against what he thinks is the cave wall. But that is not the cave wall. That is in fact a rock protruding from the ceiling. As soon as he puts his weight against the rock, it breaks loose. A solid piece weighing 15 kilograms lands directly on his ankle. It aches. But he's okay. It doesn't feel as though his ankle is broken, just badly bruised and caught underneath the rock. So he shuffles to move the rock away. Suddenly, gravel. A lot of gravel. It falls onto his feet, his legs, his torso, and the weight of it all forces the wedged rock deeper into the gap underneath his foot. Pinned. He tries to push forward. He cannot. He tries to inch backwards. He cannot. He is stuck. This is Sand Cave. This man is Floyd Collins. He is trapped in absolute darkness, 60 feet deep below the earth, all of his limbs held in place at the very bottom of this. But before I tell you what happens next, add time. Speaking <laughs> of people trapped in a cave, World of Tanks. World of Tanks is not only the best game I have ever played, it is the only game I have ever played. It's like cars, but tanks. Picture this, you're a hot new T3485M and you've just joined the battle because some Cromwell B tank bagged your entire family. It's time for revenge. You must use strategy. You must use stealth. You must use your wits to defeat your enemies. Use long range or short range. It's available on console, but I want you to get it on PC. Imagine a world war, but there are tanks involved this time. Yeah, now you get it. When you've seen as many messed up tanks as I have, you get a little cynical about the world. My God, I'm gonna be sick. Look at all the different tanks. You Oh, but so we're going to pause here for just a second because we're taking a break because we need to. I mean, we're liking the humor break here, but I'm just like so tense already. And we're only six minutes into this video. So here is my beverage for the day. It is a uh, kind of like a Manhattan, honestly, except, except for there's no vermouth in it because I didn't have any vermouth. So it is whiskey and it is pecan bitters, which if you can get your hands on like any of those like really nutty bitters, do it. Pecan bitters are amazing. The black walnut bitters are really good. Like just some of these like slightly out of the box bitters are so good and they're all cheap. Like everyone just has the regular orange bitters. Yeah, the pecan bitters are where it's at. They can make even Jameson taste amazing. <laughs> you can collectomize Nothing and customize them all. Massive battles where you can constantly team kill and ruin other people's good time. What the f I'm on your f 
Yeah! Did I mention it's historically accurate, especially the Japanese robot tanks? <laughs> oh, look, the tanks are kissing. Progressive. <laughs> Use the invite code TANKMANIA and get the Excelsior. 250k credits. Other stuff. Go to the link in the description and use the invite code TANKMANIA. Here's what you do. Get World of Tanks. Put that on one screen. Then, on a second monitor, you'll watch the next hour of this video while you play the game. Perfection. I'm contractually obliged to say thank you for being a friend. Sarge, no! My second monitor Tanks has my... Kid. Go on Cam without me. Stuff no, use your it. repair consumable. It's too late, kid. Take care of my family for me. No. <laughs> get, it, get 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 it. I won't take care of your family. Oh. Collins is still in the dark, unable to move. His left arm was pinned underneath his torso, his right wedged by the rock ceiling above. Beneath him, sharp crystal shards dug into his skin. Ice thawed, traced across the ceiling, and dripped down directly onto his face, pooling underneath him. The water was a consistent 54 degrees. Floyd tried to breathe calmly in the concentrated dark. When he did attempt to shuffle, more gravel and rocks would tumble from above and pile onto his feet, so nothing would work. He clawed at the cave walls till his fingertips were bloody, and he realized that there was only one option left. Call out for help. But wait, 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 wait. Who is Floyd? And why did he even go into a dangerous cave? Yeah, I was asking that. Floyd has been exploring the caves of Kentucky since he was merely six years old. And as he grew up, he gained a reputation for being a very daring caver. He would dive into some hole on one side of town and emerge miles away on someone else's property. Sup? He grew up and he became embroiled in the Kentucky Cave Wars. Now, there's way too much to go into here, but the summary version is there's no. this huge network of interconnected caves called Mammoth Caves. It's actually the yeah, largest cave talk system. About the Mammoth caves, miles away I on to... someone else's property. Sup? Look at the owl. He grew up and he so became weird. embroiled in the Kentucky. Look at the little owl. <laughs> Why is that? Everything about this picture is sending me. Oh my gosh, I adore it. <laughs> you got the whole time he got one of them was holding a pistol like it's a rifle. <laughs> one of them looks like he's just about to throw hands, this Benedict Cumberbatch looking one. <laughs> you got the owl just creeping in the background. Oh my god. This picture is fantastic. I need it. <laughs> Sorry. I <laughs> That's not the point of the video, but that's Key Cave Wars. Now, there's way too much to go into here, but the summary version is there's this huge network of interconnected caves called Mammoth Caves. It's actually the largest cave system in the world. And there's a city right in the middle of it. Cave City. Real name. So, of course, there are dozens of cave entrances on private property all over the place. Now, farmland in this region has very poor soil, and things do not grow well here. It said limestone so, earlier. cave tourism as a source of income quickly became the prominent thing. However, a problem. There are a very large number of caves, but there are only a limited number of tourists. So competition rapidly escalated. Visit my cave. No, 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 visit my cave. Big signs were erected saying, ah, tourists, come to me. Ah, mine is definitely open, mine is the best. But then competitors would respond by saying, hey, by the way, we're open, but don't go to that one over there. It's really shitty. In fact, it's dangerous. This kept going further. By the end, they were blocking off the trail to each other's property, beating each other in the streets, and hiring people called cappers who would dress up as policemen and tell tourists, no, 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 you can't go in there. That one, no, it's illegal. Despite the fierce competition, Floyd found a cave on his property and he started advertising it to tourists. Of course, very few came. Yeah, because there's nothing in All there. All right, he thought. What if I found something really special and unique? Then surely people would have to come to my cave to see it. So he kept exploring and exploring until he found this hollow. It was filled with big gypsum crystals. And when you were in there, it felt like a completely alien world. How'd he get in there? But it was barely accessible. This small tunnel is the only way in. He would need to dig for months to open it up to tourists, but he knew he could do it. Back to the competition. They knew the value of this cave. 
They knew the potential, they wanted it for themselves, and they wanted Collins gone. One time, five of them just wandered onto Floyd's property and demanded he hand over the lease. When he refused, they just started beating the shit out of him. This only stopped when Floyd's brother, Homer, marched out with a shotgun and chased them all off. But Floyd was not deterred. He spent 12 hours a day, every day, for months, clearing gravel and stone, chipping away at that passage. He would open it up to tourists, make his cave an incredible attraction, and make his dreams come true. So there's Floyd in the dark, yelling out for help. He's at the start of a very tiring loop. Sleep, wake, hey! yell. Sleep, wake, Hello? yell. Hours passed. His voice gave hey! in. Arms tingled numb. Pain radiating up his ankle. Here he remained in the out? dark for the next 23 hours. Quickly, you might wonder, how come no one's come for him after 23 hours? Well, Sand Cave resides on a 200-acre farm. There are several homes on this property with other families. One of them, of course, is Colin's house, where Floyd's father, Lee, resides. Now, Lee and Floyd constantly get into fights about how to run things. Lee wants his son to concentrate on farming, and Floyd wants to concentrate on cave tourism. Arguments would often get heated. And Lee was also a bit of a drunk. It was doubtful that he would even notice if his son Floyd was missing. Also not helping things, Floyd regularly lodged at two other homes on the farm. So when he didn't return to one host, they would presume that he was staying with the other. And, even worse than that, he had recently spent 30 hours in a cave. So disappearing for this length of time wasn't seen as abnormal. Regardless, around the 23 hour mark, a few locals started to suspect that, hey, something might be wrong, and they went to check up on him. And here, they spotted his jacket still hung up. Unusual. They went deeper. However, there was only one person small enough to make it as far as the turnaround room. This was a 17 year old Jewel Estes. He refused to go into the squeeze, yeah. but it was close enough to call Colin's name. Floyd! And Collins yelled back. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Estes emerges from the cave. Oh, okay, we know he's trapped, and we know where he is. So, locals started to gather outside. Out of my way say a bunch of men who would each show up and take turns heading into the cave in an attempt to reach Collins. But once they reached the turnaround room... Nope. 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 They would fail to reach him, emerging from the cave, soaked in mud and cursing. Out of my way, they would say as they were heading in the reverse direction. So a few more hours passed. Word would spread around town. Dozens of locals from Cave City started to gather outside. Over in Louisville, Floyd's twin. They still do that, yeah? Like when people get trapped in a cave, locals just show up and wait. Like they did that with the, like the Chilean miners and that soccer team. Like, like we just still do that. Why do we do? Like, why do we sit there and just hang out and wait? Like what? What do we think we're gonna do? What do we think we're gonna accomplish just by standing there and looking at this empty cave entrance? 22 year old brother, Homer. He gets a phone call. Ah, uh, hello? Our worst phone call I ever. see. Ah, my brother. He's trapped in a cave. I'm on my way. Homer jumps on a coach and makes his way to Floyd's cave. Homer struts up to the scene. Dozens of men are standing around outside. He ignores them all and marches right into the cavern, still wearing his city clothes. He makes his way in, down the chute, through the narrowing passages, down on his hands and knees towards the turnaround room. And when he arrives, he does not hesitate. <gasps> he squeezes into the hole, scrambles his way through to the ledge on the other side. He sees Floyd below and slides down to meet him. Floyd! Sup? It right, probably wasn't that casual. Oh, thank God you're here. Homer took a moment to shine his light around the area and assess the situation. It was not 
good. No. This rock formation is going to prove almost impossible to work around. All right, so let's have a look. Floyd is here. The rock is here, pinning his ankle. He's surrounded by rubble, and there's a pocket of gravel above him ready to fall. However, because this opening is so small, there are only two viable ways of reaching Floyd and that gravel. Option one, the most obvious, feet first. But if you do this, you have to kind of squat, and your own torso obstructs access to the rubble. Otherwise, option two, come down head first. That will give you better access, but you're trying to move hundreds of pounds of gravel upside down. And how can you get back Worse up? Worse yet, there's barely an inch around Collins on either side. So good luck getting your arm down near Floyd's ankle to actually free him from the wedged rock. Homer calls back to the less daring rescuers standing behind him. Quickly, some food and drink. They send it through. He hand feeds his brother a pint of coffee and a total of nine sausage sandwiches. Feeling better? Much better. Then no water? Homer went to task. He began removing rocks and gravel, tiny scoop at a time, with the help of an old syrup can. Syrup can. For the next eight hours he toiled, first with hands, then once enough was cleared, using a crowbar to scoop behind his brother, <gasps> scraping away sharp protrusions as he went. It was slow progress. Virtually futile. As soon as he removed one rock or scoop of gravel, another would tumble from above and land in the new absence. And it was exhausting work. By sunrise, Homer's arms and back were knackered. His lungs burned. He was losing hope. Homer emerged hours later, shivering violently, skin bruised from his fingertips. But the cave barely yielded at all. However, something new. By the time Homer reached outside, he was greeted by a sea of approximately 100 men and women standing around, drinking, squabbling, and talking big game about how they too were going to save Floyd. Oh yeah? The press was also present to help people gawk from afar. Now, Homer recuperated at a small tent near the cave's mouth. Oh wow. Strangers immediately crowded around him to ask innocent, but frankly, frustrating questions and offer unsolicited, obvious advice as well as wildly impractical solutions. He should try untying his shoes, said one. Ah, no, we should send him down with a contortionist who's got a mallet and a chisel. Ah, we, we should yeah. jerk him off, right guys? <laughs> All right, I made that third guy up. Just go, just go to your, your local contortionist shop and give where are you going to find a contortionist? Like, sometimes I know that, like, circuses and stuff would have that kind of, like, have, have people who could do that, but, yo. <laughs> yo, maybe we can find a contortionist. Maybe you can find a demigod. <laughs> maybe you can find an earthbender, yo. <laughs> like, what? But you get the idea. And they started to argue with each other about their plans. Oh, silly and hey, silly and how about using dynamite? One click formed, insisting that it was a great idea. And another saying, no, 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 the explosion will kill him and the weight of the new rocks yeah. will surely crush him. Well, they fought works. for a while until they started arguing about gas torches, which will cook him or asphyxiate him or the gas will poison him. But by far the most common suggestion, of course, was amputation. Never mind that the foot itself was unreachable, and never mind what the blood loss and shock would do to Floyd's weakened body, and never minding even more that Floyd was strongly reluctant to the idea. Yeah, you think? Whatever you do, don't, don't cut, cut my, my foot off. <laughs> All of the squabble would not have gotten on Homer's nerves, except that not one of them would just brave the damn cave and continue shoveling away the gravel. The formula was always the same. Brave heroes go in with food and supplies, then reach the turnaround room and immediately lose their nerve, then dump the food just outside the hole, and then return back outside and go, oh, absolutely, no, he says, thanks for the food, thank you so much. Yum, yum. No one would go through that squeeze. Dozens oh more God. men would try. All of them would fail. February 2nd, 9am. So far, Homer has been the 
only Ugh. person so like to have reached too. Floyd. And that would continue to be true until... Here we are at the Louisville Courier. There's a spirited young news hawk named William Miller. He's talking to his boss, and he's trying to convince him that it's a great idea for him to cover the story of the man trapped in the cave. Listen up, boss. I'm hearing talk of a man in a cave. He's stuck down there, and I want to get down there, too. Get to the nitty-gritty, you hear? This is an opportunity for some good PR, Miller. I'm in. But I want us to sponsor that rescue. Picture this. Man saved from cave by Louisville Courier, the finest newspaper in the state. That'll drum up plenty of business. 24 carat idea, boss. I'll make it happen. I'll get down there too sweet. So off Miller goes to Floyd's cave. Another three hours or so. Back over at the cave, Homer is sitting outside trying to recuperate as Miller wanders up. He glares at the man in his city clothes and answers every question with either a grunt or a one word answer. Eh, yeah, sure. Finally, he gestures to Sand Cave. Listen, you want more information? The hole's right behind me. Why don't you go take a look yourself? Now, Miller is only 21, but he is a slender and determined man. He takes on the challenge. So he removes his suit, drapes himself in coveralls, and grabs a lamp. Okay. Miller slowly enters the cave. He finds himself stepping in puddles and having to correct his balance against the ever softening walls. These were accumulating problems thanks to the gawkers outside who had lit campfires all around the entrance. That caused snowmelt, and the stable environment of the cave is starting to shift. Great. But Miller makes it further than most. And all that's left is that final squeeze, and he's there. He stops. He takes a moment and decides to call out to Floyd. Floyd! Hearing there is someone on the other side, he feels ashamed not to try. So he closes his eyes and moves forward. His slender figure begins inching through. The crystal gypsum cuts into his elbows and tugs at his clothes. He gets snagged. He's spluttering through the pools of muddy water. He stops, collects himself, and pushes on. Like he can worse. barely inhale. If he gets stuck in here, he can only hope that someone else can come in from behind and pull him out by the legs. But eventually, he makes it through. Fantastic. He's now standing on the edge of a 10-foot pit, and he clumsily bumbles his way down. He sat right next to Floyd, ready to interview. Him. <laughs> but Floyd didn't really answer any of his questions. In fact, he was incoherent. At the moment, he is sitting in a pool. Oh my God, that's such a freaking journalist thing to do. It's like, no, no, I'm not here to, I just need you to answer some questions and then I'm a dip. Oh my God. It's not funny. Um, but now I'm getting to a, a point where I'm like, well, maybe this guy doesn't die. So I'm just like, that's hilarious that the journalist, he does all of this and then he immediately just starts asking questions instead of trying to help. Oh my God. God, that is such a journalist thing to do. ...pool of water that is 12 degrees, slowly sapping his body temperature. He is dying from exposure. Yes. The cold is diminishing Floyd's mental faculties, and he can barely make sentences. So Miller took a few mental notes, and he left. He worked his way back through the squeeze, past the turnaround room, and out into the daylight. He is covered in mud and scratches and numb head to toe. And when Homer saw, his hope reignited. Someone else had made it to Floyd. You and me, together, we can get Floyd out of there. All right. If Miller hadn't gone to that cave, there's a good chance that Floyd's story would have remained an obscure footnote in the back pages. But the interviews and first person accounts gave the audience a glimpse of something real. Fear, hope, desperation, the full range. And so from Los Angeles to New York, Floyd's story was picked up everywhere and described the Kentucky man's plight in sensational detail. It was also the era when radio became a regular feature for regular Americans. Radio allowed something new, hourly updates, letting people get engrossed into the story. So, mostly thanks to Miller, the story of Floyd over the next week would grow and grow. 
seemingly frothing over into every aspect of American life. The press at large would be clamoring over each other for every little extra scrap of detail they could get about Floyd. And everybody wanted to know, will this man make it? Back outside the cave, someone new enters the scene. Lieutenant Robert Burden, a thin but strong 33-year-old Louisville firefighter. Like Miller, he was able to navigate the passages of the cave and brave the squeeze. Scratched up pretty good and drenched in cold, muddy water, he managed to get through. He grabbed the rope and confidently lowered himself to Floyd's position. It was not an optimistic sight. Floyd's condition was deteriorating. Yeah. Well, we've got a heck of a problem here, but I think I can get you out with a rope. Floyd nods in approval. Go on. We might just pull your bloody leg off. Just pull my leg off then. <laughs> get me out of here. Burden returned to the surface and faced the crowd. He announced, We will attempt a rope pull. The crowd murmured. It was dangerous. It would certainly break his foot and could altogether pull it off. If there are jagged rocks, you'll fill it, the poor man. Amongst the crowd, a doctor stepped forward. A rope pull could stretch his internal organs and cause them to rupture. You'll kill him. But Floyd is dying of exposure down there. The situation like is becoming desperate. Burden put caution to the side. The time for strategy is over. Now we try brute force. Jesus Christ. That was terrifying, I hated that. I knew, I knew. I was like, if that rock starts talking, I'm out. <laughs> here. After 79 hours in the cold water, he is delirious, fading in and out of consciousness. Homer gave his brother some coffee and fed him a couple of ham sandwiches. That warms him up and gives him a bit more energy, and he comes back to lucidity. It's water, yo. Oh, much better. I'm gonna put the special harness around you. Burden and Miller, they're here too. We got three more boys right up the cave and they're all ready to pull as hard as they can to get you out of here. Floyd was frightened. I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna hurt. He gave his brother some whiskey and a strong sedative to uh, calm his whiskey. nerves, and also to help him withstand the shock in case his foot is destroyed. Floyd yes, took the opportunity to appreciate being surrounded by friends and family. Go on, do it. All right, strap him up. Homer tied the harness around Colin's chest and knotted the rope. Ready? Above? Miller is crouched at the top of the pit. Ready! Burden clenches the cord from further up the cave. Three! The, gloves. the rope goes taut. Two! Do it! One! Oh, snap! Oh! Instinctively, Floyd gasps. The force of six men pulled against the clutches of the cave. Floyd began to scream. His body was being pulled oh up God. from the rock. The gravel was beginning to shift. Burden clenched his teeth. Floyd screamed harder as well. Now, Floyd was trapped in a supine position, but the direction of the rope caused an upwards force that wrenched him vertically. His torso was being compressed and bent against the ceiling of the trap. It would kill him. Floyd's screaming intensified, and through gasps was begging them to stop. The screams filled the echoing cave, but it did not stop. The agony continued, on and on, with no progress. Enough! Enough! You guys are killing him! Homer pulled in the opposite stop. direction to give his brother some reprieve. Somehow, Homer mustered the strength to altogether wrench the cord from the other men's hands. The rope went slack. Adrenaline, Homer, yeah. Floyd, and the rope lay limp on the cave floor, panting and exhausted. No progress had been made. None. The cave would not let this man go. The futility of the situation sank in, and all they could do was leave for now and reassess. Everybody was shaken by the experience. Burden fainted as he crawled towards oh. the exit. 
Most of the other men had to be carried away. Outside, the crowd had grown to 200. They buzzed and asked useless questions, and Homer walked dejectedly past them. He sat by thinking what he could do. The cause seemed hopeless. Homer? Then, someone showed up who could turn things around. He looked up to see a childhood friend of both his and Floyd's, Johnny Gerald. Gerald knew more about cave rescues than most. In fact, just that summer prior, he had helped untangle Floyd from a different snag. He was just the man for the job. Why'd he take so long? All right, let me go see him. Well, look who it is. Floyd perked up immediately. Yay. Thrilled to see Gerald. Why'd it take right. 80 hours? Let's see what we can do. Gerald Loser. jumped down. Terrible friend. For the next three hours, Gerald went back to the original plan of prying away rocks. His stamina was good, and progress was surprisingly good as well. For several more hours, he continued, just moving stone after stone. A new one would fall in his place, and he'd move that one too. By midnight, he had enough room to shift position and clear some of the gravel that was at each side of Floyd's body. Gerald would spend several more hours scooping, and it worked. For the first time, Floyd's torso was now available. Then his hips, his upper thigh. For the first time okay. in over 90 hours, Floyd was able to wiggle his arms, his hips, and even that trapped right leg. The okay, so why did it take this man this long to get here then, if he is this capable? I mean, like, he's willing to spend eight hours down here just shifting shit. Like, where were you 80 hours ago, my man? I hope they tell me where he was at. Though it was very painful to do. In that one session, Gerald managed to move a half ton of rock, but there was still a lot more to go. And that rock by his foot was still holding him in place. By 2 a.m., Gerald was spent. Yeah, He needed fair. rest, and he was ready to head back outside. Floyd, tomorrow you're gonna be a free man. Now here you might think that things will become straightforward. No. They did not. Now that that space had been cleared, Burden became convinced that if he could get down that passage again, he could free Floyd with another rope pull. Fate deciding, with both feet or just one. But when Burden tried to enter the cave again, he was sternly rebuffed by the locals. They were playing gatekeeper. They had been specifically instructed to not let anyone in, and they were especially opposed to Burden making another rope pull after word spread about the disaster of the first attempt. He tried to reason with them. Let me try the rope pull again. It'll work this time. They wouldn't let up. Instead, they shouted obscenities and shoved him Oof. in the other direction. No, like, what are they doing? Ugh. Hate locals. Locals are the worst. Meanwhile, Gerald and Homer are incapacitated with exhaustion. And Miller was busy filing some paperwork for the Louisville Courier. Nobody yeah, else had the ability or the authority to take action. Or the willingness. So Floyd spent all of that morning alone. Is anyone, Is anyone there? there? Help. Help. Hey. hey. Anyone out there? Word spread about Floyd. Miller's reporting had been picked up by the AP Newswire, and they distributed it amongst their hundreds of partnered newspapers. For Miller, it would be the biggest moment of his career. But he didn't stop to pay it mind. He spent the day hatching a rescue plan. Miller descended into the cave and set to work. When he entered, he found that the team before him had strung light bulbs all through the cavern, hmm. leading all the way down to Floyd. That's nice. Very handy. A bulb was also put around Floyd's neck to keep him warm and make sure that he was never again left in the dark. Aww. Miller popped down to Floyd. Ah, Floyd, fancy seeing you here, buddy. Reusing that syrup tin, he started offloading gravel into buckets. Those buckets were then passed up and down the cavern. And so it went on for the next two hours. Miller stopped for a break. He took some bread, milk, and whiskey. And sharing it with Floyd, they started to get to talking. Aww. Floyd had been in that cave for over 100 hours now. And seeing everyone working together, Floyd was overcome with a sense of hope and relief. And so he began spilling his heart out to Miller. Here is what he is quoted in the newspaper. I believed I would go to heaven. I can feel that I'm to be taken out alive and with both my feet. 
I kept thinking, what would happen if the rock above me would fall? It, it caused me to shudder. I kept thinking to drive my mind to something else, but it wasn't much use. I couldn't do much to help those who came to help me, but I knew that a lot of people were willing to do all in their power. It gave me courage. Tuesday morning, I thought to myself, four days down here and no nearer freedom than I was on the first day. How will it end? Will I get out? I couldn't think of it. I have faced death before. It doesn't frighten me, but it is so long. Tell them I am not going to give up. Tell them I am going to fight and be patient and never forget them. Meanwhile, Floyd's story kept growing. Pedestrians would gather around corner store windows to read the latest bulletins. The press began using giant typefaces, commonly only reserved for declarations of war. <laughs> Churches in all of the nearby counties were holding services for Floyd. Theatres even interrupted their shows to update the audience. Now, at Jesus. the time, President Coolidge was in charge, and his Secretary of Commerce was a geologist, Herbert Hoover. Oh. Now, Mr. Hoover no, wait, followed no, stop, the story very closely, and so typefaces, commonly but only reserved for declarations of war. Churches in all of the nearby counties were holding services for Floyd. Theatres even interrupted their shows so to update the audience. Now, at the time, President Coolidge was in charge, and his Secretary of Commerce was a geologist, Herbert. All right, he'll go on to be the 30th. <laughs> He'll go on to be the 31st president and have that dam named after him. Don't get confused with J. Edgar Hoover. Oh my god. That's true. I did not know that Herbert Hoover was a geologist. That's really cool. I had no idea. J. Edgar Hoover was the FBI guy who, like, wiretapped all the phones. Oh, that is fun. I did not know. Okay. Learning stuff. I love it. Hoover. Now, Mr. Hoover followed the story very closely, and so it was likely that the president did too. Even Congress paused session to ask about the latest news from Sand Cave. By the end, the Floyd Collins incident would explode into the third largest non-political story between Lindenburg World War I and, and, and World War II. It was Lindenburg. All of this excitement brought an inundation of people to Cave City. Old population, 690. Yawn. New population, 10,000. Hotels ran out of food. Residents turned their homes into makeshift hotels, charging sizable premiums to let people... The first Airbnbs, y'all! <laughs> Oh my god, that's wild. Again, I don't, I still, I guess I don't understand, it's like, the, I, I get it like slowing down on the highway when there's a wreck, you know, you rubberneck it, but like, I don't understand purposely going somewhere where you know you're not going to be of any use, you just sit there and watch, like, is it just to say that you were there? It's like, I was there when they arose, I mean, like, that could be cool, I guess, to say that you were there when the guy was saved that the entire nation is obsessed with like ah all right i sort of talked my way into being uh to understanding that but as i've done that i've gone increasingly creeped out by the ratios of this room and it just feels really warped and crazy and terrifying so i'm gonna continue playing it because i do not like the way this room is shaped nap in their bathtubs the banks quickly ran out of on-hand cash, and 4,500 automobiles impatiently sat, backed up for two miles from 20 different states to drive onto the Collins farm and turn their pristine green pastures into swampy parking lots. Great. Deep blow all those tourists. There's Miller, trying to free Floyd. All right, a little bit of setup. Floyd, Miller, some remaining rubble, rock. For anyone to lift the rock by hand would be impossible yeah. because Floyd's body obstructs the hole. Miller grabs a crowbar and shoves it through the gap. Now he's going to lever it off Floyd's foot. Cool. The crowbar is now wedged against the rock. Next, he takes a jack. He positions it on top of the crowbar so that it will be forced That's against so the ceiling. However, problem. That jack is too big. It doesn't fit. Miller yells up the tunnel for a smaller one, but this took some time. 
and when it arrived, too small, won't reach the ceiling. But instead of sending for another one, Miller takes two blocks of wood and bolsters them underneath the crowbar. Right, so the crowbar now sits higher, it fulcrums against the blocks, and the jack is sitting on top. All Miller has to do is expand the jack, which he will do using this spanner, holding it at the very tips of his fingers. Sounds easy. It's not. But that's the plan. Let's get him out of there. He turned the wrench. The jack expanded, and the crowbar took strain. The whole thing slid apart with a pang. Floyd wasn't hurt, but Miller was contorting and exerting his whole body from back to fingertip. They tried again. Same result. Miller tried a new angle. Maybe this time. The jack pressed. The tension increased. And this time, the rock moved. It fucking moved. With each turn, the stone shifted a little more. Miller's hands shook with adrenaline, his face and body dripping with sweat. Yeah, this man's... One of the blocks... This slipped. man's just an effing pencil pusher, right? He's just a journalist. <laughs> like, I say just a journalist. I can see Anderson Cooper doing something like this. But, like... I mean, I... <laughs> just can't, I can't even imagine. Like, that's incredible. And the wooden tower went sideways. The rock painfully slammed back down on Colin's foot. Ah, you'll get it next time, Miller. Try again. Miller did. Again. And again. Adding blocks. Taking them away. New crowbar position. Changed the jack position. Every angle. All while Floyd was there, cheering him on. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Go. For the next four hours, he tried. No progress. Miller was exhausted. He couldn't do this on his own, but he was the only one slim enough to get in through the gap. The group decided enough, to concede for now and return to the surface. They would take just a small break, but it looked to everyone like there was a clear way to get this man out. So Miller and Burden crawl back through the mud and the winds of the cave. As they made their way through, the cave was visibly sagging. The ceiling seemed lower. Parts were harder to navigate than before, especially now with their bruised and purple hands. Tired. But they made it outside to the fresh early morning air. And here is where they're greeted with a new sight. Dozens of soldiers. The National Guard had arrived. In addition to the National Guard, a new figure was joining the story, Henry Carmichael. Now, Carmichael was the general superintendent of the Kentucky Rock Asphalt Company. He had been on site since Tuesday, and he was appalled at how primitive the rescue attempts had been. Shortly after Miller and co. had exited, Carmichael sent two men into Sand Cave to assess the structure's stability. They soon came back with yeah, a report. Not good. <laughs> it was not good. Near the final squeeze, large cracks had formed. The ceiling was beginning to droop. All right, so the following is a recounting of events from one of Carmichael's men, Casey Jones. <clears throat> Casey and another worker spent about an hour in the cave surveying its condition, looking at the boards, the ceiling, the stability of the walls. He continued deeper towards Floyd. He was fighting against his nerves. The shifting of the rock pinged his every instinct to flee. But he heard Collins moaning ahead. So he pushed himself on. He managed to make it through the squeeze and he arrived at the 10-foot pit. Seeing Floyd trapped, he tried to ignore the pebbles that were tumbling behind him. Jesus. Please, come down. Uh, I can't right now, Floyd, but I will when I get back. Behind Casey, his partner is begging to leave. Below Casey, Collins is pleading for help. Please, I'm so thirsty. Yeah, okay. I haven't had water in a week. Casey slid headfirst into the pit and hastily ladled Floyd some coffee. But Floyd rejected it. No, no. Ra Ron needs some water, yo! No one has given him water. He has had coffee and whiskey only for, like, a solid week. Hydration is key, yo! Also, I feel like I haven't had a ton of really stupid things to say this video, so, um... We'll keep playing the stupid game, but also we can just play the the game that I've been playing, which is we drink whiskey when he gets whiskey. Um, and then we can also play <laughs> just, you know, drink.
drink when I drink. Let's do that. Let's all drink together. Rumbling intensified from above. And in that moment, Casey realized that this was not a plea for sustenance. Floyd knew that a cave-in was inevitable. Scared and approaching his fifth day trapped, he was completely at his wit's end. He knew he was about to be trapped in that cave, and he didn't want to be trapped alone. For God's sake, Casey, come on, you'll get us killed. Stay with me, please, don't leave. Ooh. Casey looked into Colin's eyes, set the coffee down, and pulled himself out of the Yeah. He wiggled underneath the sagging ceiling and crawled towards the turnaround room as fast as his limbs could scramble against the cave walls. He looked back to see the passage closing like a maw. Oh Reflections from the bulb shining around Floyd's neck were no longer visible. Instead, just sobs could be heard, muffled oh from behind God. the rocks. Remember how 10 minutes ago I said I thought this might have a happy awoke ending? In the late morning, confident that today would be the day that they saved Floyd. They had some new equipment too. Some wire to wrap around the wooden blocks to prevent them from slipping. And they changed their mind about that acetylene torch. They'll use it to burn away two rocks that had previously blocked their way. But when Miller got to the turnaround room, all of that optimism left him. Holy shit, did Casey Jones, freaking train dude, and like the other guy just not tell anybody that there was a cave, there, a cave that had happened? Did they just not tell anybody that? What the f The entrance to the squeeze was now just a pile of debris. Miller froze, staring at it for a long while. Then he sighed and did the only thing he could think attempt to move some of the stones. But each adjustment led to more rocks just tumbling down and landing in that space. He persisted until, crash, a large chunk of clay landed onto his feet. Recognizing the danger, Miller returned to the surface. 15 minutes later, he emerged from the cave with a bloodied up nose and bruises down his back and shoulders. Burden caught sight and races over to him. Miller just says, for God's sake, just don't let Homer or anyone else back in there. Now, he didn't actually need to worry about Homer going back in there because he was sidelined with illness. But he did, however, need to worry about Gerald because he was furious. Gerald had warned everyone that putting dozens of people in Sand Cave would cause a collapse. It certainly did. The rest of that day would be wasted as men threw blame around and screamed at each other about how to handle the cave-in. And Floyd spent the rest of that day alone. Uh. Bro, this is, is the, so this is literally the first 127 hours, yeah? Like, that's the OG 127 hours. Ugh, there's so much more of this. So I again, I can still hope that this has a happy ending. Like, God, I just can't even imagine that you like you're you're ch if he's so trapped, like I mean, I've I I you know, I used to want to go caving. Um, my brother got to go on like a Boy Scout trip and I was like furious that they didn't let me go. Um, again, that was a safe trip. I would still like to go caving in like a safe environment. I love that kind of thing. Um, like whenever I go hiking, I, it's more of a exploration sort of thing. So it's like I go on the trail for a while and I see something interesting and I dart off. Like I get the exploration I idea, but like when you're, when it comes <laughs> to something that teeny tiny, it's like, why? Didn't he spend a little bit more time trying to widen the squeeze? Like, if he's going to spend that many months trying to clear out that that room, it's like, you're not going to get any tourists down there if they can't get through that squeeze area. You have to widen that. So I don't know why he didn't start with that. Also, limestone is, like... Isn't it, like, notoriously crumbly? Like, it's really dangerous to work with limestone. From, like, I, I think. That might be a stupid Lauren thing, but... I don't know, like... 
<sighs> We're fine. We're fine. The Over. surveyors continued checking the cave throughout the day. By the evening, Carmichael had ordered everyone to an assembly. Gerald took the floor. He was going to try one last daring rescue. He boldly announced his plan and an ultimatum. Listen up. There's death down there. The walls and ceilings are crumbling. Unless you're determined to take the biggest chance you ever took in your life, tell me now and stay outside. Next, they told all the Gorkas to get the fuck out of yeah. the cave, clear off. They should have done that a long and time over ago. over the next eight hours, Gerald would enter and leave Sand Cave at least five times, chipping away at that pile of debris. In the woods, men sawed trees and chopped logs to shore up the cave walls. Underground, the crew reinforced cracks and wobbling boulders with fresh strips of wood. Gerald assessed that about four barrels of rocks would need to be moved, and piece by piece, they made that happen. Steadily, they managed to move enough rock to allow Gerald to get within earshot of Floyd. Hey, hello, I need food. Bad news, we can't reach you, but hold on, we're coming. Stone by stone, they continued. After a few hours, the light of the bulb around Floyd's neck was peeking through. A couple more hours, enough room for Gerald to squeeze through. Okay, that's enough. Floyd, I'm going for now, but when I get back, I'm gonna get you out of there. Exhausted but still determined, Gerald crawled back up the cave and marched to the men huddling outside. Gather the equipment, and in an hour's time, it's gonna be me and Floyd coming out of that cave. Gerald entered Sand Cave for his final time. The walls had been reinforced. Spoilers. But mud and water was accumulating everywhere. He waded through it and pressed on past the danger of the sagging ceiling. With determination on his face and a grease gun clutched in his right hand, he scrambled towards Floyd. But before the final squeeze, he stopped. It was all gone. The cave ceiling had crumbled once again. Gerald stared motionlessly at the pile. Then he began to yell. Floyd! A rock disconnected from the ceiling and tumbled onto Gerald's head. Luckily, just a small one. He rubbed his scalp and called out again. Floyd! This time, a moan. It rumbled from the other side. Fearing that his friend was slipping out of consciousness, Gerald willed himself against the cave, launching the debris behind him with force. He ignored the pain from being struck on the head and clawed at the stone pile. He carried on this way for several minutes until a sharp, heavy rock dropped from the ceiling and landed squarely on his back. No more than 15 minutes later, Gerald returned to the surface, defeated. Only after the cave did they start to think about all of the things that they could have done. Wait, why didn't we rig a portable telephone line? That would have been incredibly simple here in 1925. Yeah, why have we been running in and out to deliver updates? Why didn't we give him an AM radio? He could have had something to listen to and receive messages of support from the public. Wait, why don't we rig up a tarpaulin so we could lift his torso up so he wouldn't be slowly dying of exposure? Oh God, why didn't we run a feeding tube? That's also a technology we have in 1925. All too late. Now what? The one route to get to Floyd is closed forever. That meant two options. All right, so can they, I, I, before they tell me what the options are, um, we know that dynamite is bad right where he's at, but can they go a little further and blow something up and then go in the other direction. Is that a viable possibility? Or do they are they just going to assume that the state the structure of the cave is too unstable for that too? Options. Number one, capitulation. Surrender him to the cave. Or well, number two, dig down from directly above Floyd. Now, the prospect of digging from above seemed almost fanciful. At least, it did in the beginning. Yeah, but luckily, like they resort. had some help. Owing to Miller's reporting, 
Floyd had become practically the most famous person in the country. The rescue had become a high priority for the governor of Kentucky. Lieutenant General Denhardt enters the scene. Nope, he'll go on to murder his girlfriend, Verna Taylor. He's brought to trial, but results in a hung jury. Before his retrial, Verna's brothers tracked him down and shot him to death, and they were all acquitted. Cool. Good for, good for her brothers. I also like, it's like, mm, okay, so you might help now, but you're an asshole. He's been updated on the situation, and following shortly behind him is a small army of miners and engineers. He declared to the despondent crowd, Gentlemen, I am here on behalf of the governor. The purse strings of Kentucky are open. Take this blank check and bring that man out alive. Floyd in that cold, wet confine could not have imagined the scale of the operation that was going on 55 feet above him. Authorities assumed control of Collins' rescue. Denhart gave Henry Carmichael the lead to dig, and Carmichael raced to get to work. He enlisted his employees, his fleet of expensive high-tech machinery. Professional groups were brought in from all across the state. Local oh, townspeople were real. mostly uh, excluded going on Let's look at them 55 there. feet above him. Authorities assumed control of Collins' rescue. Denhart gave Henry Carmichael the lead to dig, and Carmichael raced to get to work. He enlisted his employees, his fleet of expensive high-tech machinery. Professional groups were brought in from all across... Okay. I wonder if these were, like, the real people. I mean, we got this weird Minecraft dude in the back over here. On the, with the miners. <laughs> uh. That would be interesting if these were the real pictures. Who knows? I don't know. They look a little photoshopped, but... ...across the state. Local townspeople were mostly excluded. Yeah, and out. for the You've first time since Collins had been trapped, work was now about to go ahead in a systematic manner. Everyone knew the plan. Everyone had something to do. And everyone was working fast. But just as hopes were rising, they were once again dashed against the rocks. They had all of this state-of-the-art machinery shipped in and assembled by the engineers and rearing to go. And it was all worthless. See, the problem is, the cave drew air into it. These diesel-powered engines pumped out enormous volumes of choking exhaust. Within a day's operation, the cave would be filled with carbon monoxide and Floyd would be dead from asphyxiation. Just as quickly as solutions would arise, the cave way to would go carry them away. Suffocation from it refused Ethan. to let this man go. So engineers and miners had wasted hours assembling everything, only to realize that they had to pack it all up and cart it away. Because the digging of a 55-foot shaft would be done with picks and shovels. Carmichael didn't know much about caves. But he knew a lot about quarrying, and he estimated that his team of 75 volunteers could dig and dredge at a rate of two feet per hour. If they worked around the clock, they would be digging directly into the spot where Floyd lays within 30 hours. Now, was it possible that Floyd could survive for another 30 hours? Absolutely. Have... Really? Let's go. The first ton he had was moved, or water in a and long at first time. it was easy work. Just dirt and clay. Carmichael understood well that this was a race against time, so he watched the men closely, and if they seemed to be slowing down, even a little, they would be yanked out and immediately a new worker subbed in. Okay. Nonetheless, the pace slowed. By 10 feet, the shaft narrowed greatly, which meant that only two men could work at a time. At 15 feet, they hit boulders. Pickaxes went in, and a system of pulleys and buckets had to be used to cart the rock out. Tracks were even laid to ferry the refuse to a dump site. Time that passed. Hours passed. Night 
went today. The day was hot. This was yet another problem, because it's early February, there's tons of ice still in the ground, and its exposure to the fresh midday sun meant that the walls of the shaft were softening and the ground becoming sodden. The pace of digging slowed. It was now only half a foot per hour. Most anyone could do was watch helplessly on the sidelines and pray. Interestingly though, there were a lot of people on the sidelines. Floyd wouldn't have believed that the space above him had turned into a literal carnival in his honor. Vendors showed up to sell hamburgers, hot dogs, and souvenirs. Families sprawled out over blankets to listen to hymns from local church groups. The local mountebanks sold moonshine and miracle cures. There was even a bloody juggler. And old man Lee was there, walking around, shaking his jar, and soliciting donations. Oh my God. But where were Homer and Burden and Miller during all of this? Okay, let's back up a bit. People did not properly understand exactly how Floyd was trapped, and the news didn't help much either. So the obvious question started to arise. Why hasn't he been rescued yet? Just clear some gravel or pull a rope. How is this so hard? Motive was attributed. I heard they didn't even want to have him rescued at all. I heard that they're doing all of this for publicity. And Lee's activity of soliciting donations, remember from before, further inflamed rumours. I bet Floyd isn't even trapped in there. These were all real rumours, and they got worse. You know what? I've heard he comes out at night, and then he just goes back in in the morning. Other rumours included... I heard that after Floyd went into the cave, someone murdered him. Others said... I think they're withholding food and water from him, so he dies. This whole thing is a fraud. As time went on, it was harder and harder to ignore the hoax claims. Then, people started to form righteous mobs, claiming the whole thing was a fraud, and they started to get nasty. In fact, two people even went to the telegraph office and pretended to be Floyd sending telegrams to his mother. Where's my... No, 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 stop it. I want to see what it says. The fraud! As time went on, it was harder and harder to ignore the hoax claims. Then, people started to form righteous mobs, claiming the whole thing was a fraud, and they started to get nasty. In fact, two people even went to the telegraph office and pretended to be Floyd. Floyd's mother died years prior. Since then, his father Lee had married a younger woman. Floyd and his stepmother got along well, but he did not see her in a fraternal way. The forger had no understanding of their family structure and just went with the mother. Okay. Sending telegrams to his mother. Here's what it said. Quote, Please contradict statements that I am buried alive in Sand Cave. Stop. Tell mother I am all right. Stop. Am coming home. What? Stop. People are... Floyd Collins. People are terrible. Naturally, the AP published these telegrams unquestioningly, and now word is out to the press that he isn't actually in the cave after all. That made the authorities look foolish, and it could not go on. So, a hasty court-martial was arranged, and Homer, Miller, and Gerald were summoned. They hold one session on Monday and another on Tuesday. Lee and everyone else is cleared of charges, a retraction is written, and things carry on. <laughs> the house off. Generators rumbled. Pumps churned out water. Men continued working in shifts and carrying away the earth. Here they are with strips of lumber to shore up the walls. They were only 25 feet down. The pace had slowed to four inches per hour. In their desperation, they resorted to dynamite. Yeah. But this did little to the boulders. Really? Despite all these bleak circumstances, people's spirits were high because everyone was keen for their turn to dig. And? because they had one more thing to latch onto. He is probably still alive. You think so? No, how do they know that? Okay, so remember that light bulb around Floyd's neck? Well, it's powered by a simple copper wire. Bare copper wire is subject to very minute fluctuations in resistance. So, an engineer rigs up a radio amplifier to this wire to read the current and see those small fluctuations. There they were. 
about 20 per minute, the rate of steady breathing. As his chest expands and contracts, they can read it from this device. That's so cool! And so, they kept going. Holy shit, 1920s technology, win! Oh and going. And going. 30 hours was the original estimate. Now 144 hours had come and gone and they were only at 44 feet. Then rain fell. Rain that mixed with dirt to make mud. Much of which then froze to make ice. Ice which expanded and damaged the integrity of the shaft walls. Slowing down with every hour, they continued. Many more hours passed and they were getting close. But it was now 15 days since Floyd was first stuck in that cave and, and people like had twice. mostly lost hope. That excitement in the newspapers was tempering down. Visitors began clearing out from Good. Cave City. Useless. Many still held on to hope, but their final lifeline, that light bulb, had burnt out. And it wasn't possible to do any more readings on the radio amplifier without it. No one knew. Can you imagine that though? Just like he's, now he knows he's trapped from above after he tried to get someone killed with him. But like, I, you know, makes sense, I guess. You don't want to die alone. But like, he knows no one's coming from that direction. And he has no idea what's going on elsewhere is above him. Maybe he hears some sounds, maybe not. But then that light just slowly flickering and dimming and dying. And then you're in the dark again. How do you not give up? If Floyd was still alive. Another 51 hours would pass before, finally, they reached the 60-foot depth. I'm in. Chisel. A chisel is handed down. At 1.30 p.m. on Monday, February 16th, Sand Cave would open once again. For 17 days, Floyd had been trapped underground stuck in the same position. Four days without heat or light. Twelve without food or water. But maybe the dripping of the cave water had provided him with some sustenance? That would have to be it. There are like... stories of people surviving harsher extremes. Rescuers frantically tugged at rocks to widen the hole. Everybody stood by, absolutely silent, peering into that hole. Ed flashed his light into the gap, then eased himself in. Brenna aimed his light around the room, and then, finally, at Floyd. The first thing he saw was a golden shimmer. It was not the light bulb. It was the reflection of Floyd's tooth. His mouth hung open. He was dead. Brenna was helped out of the cave, and he delivered the news. Dead. Man, I really thought that there was a chance there. I guess at the moment, beginning, he talked about a sacrifice for the cave or whatever, but God. I really thought that there was a half a chance that he might survive. Except for the lack of water thing. A I'm coroner would about. later state that Floyd succumbed to exposure and that they had missed him by just three days. That's a lot of about days. About the same time that the light bulb had gone out. Well, see, that's, that's what I said too. It's like at that point, the light bulb goes out. Like, you know, how do you not give up at that point? Like you've got, if you've got the light, like now you, like you're hoping you can still hope, but as soon as that light goes out again, it's how do you try and keep fighting? But what would they do now with the body? The shaft walls were ready to fall inwards and risking lives to remove a corpse was seen as just irresponsible. So the following morning, officials made a decision. Floyd would be entombed where he lay. The cave would keep its victim. Now this did not sit well with the family, 
but what could they do? The next day, they planned the funeral. The town emptied of people, and the shaft with Floyd at the bottom was refilled with soil. But that's not quite the end of the story. But if you hung on for this long, keep holding on, because things are going to continue to get interesting. But first, let me do a wrap-up of where everyone is and all that stuff. Context, context. The Collins family already had financial hardship. Locals saw old man Lee scouring the rescue site for glass bottles. But the owner of the lamb, B. Doyle, and supposed friend of Floyd, was wholly unsympathetic. He erected a sign on the highway which said, 200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins is imprisoned in Sand Cave. Then he began charging tourists 50 cents apiece for the opportunity to gander into the hole. It's 100 years later, B's dead. Let's call it even. Also, remember those claims of Kentucky being an open purse? Well, the state reneged on the deal. They refused to pay many of the rescuers, and most of them went home without any compensation. Some of them did make some money out of the situation, though. They lucked into vaudeville gigs and roamed the country, giving their first-person account. Miller, however, received an astonishing offer, a $50,000 contract from the Chautauqua Lecture Circuit, equivalent to the better part of a million dollars in today's money. He declined. Oh, wow. He continued to work at the Louisville Courier Journal. The following year, his coverage of Floyd's story earned him the Pulitzer Prize. Wow. Now, the brother, Homer, he needed money and he agreed to do that vaudeville circuit. He stood on stage and regaled the audience about tales of his brother, their childhood, and the tragedy. But Homer made it known why he was up here on stage trying to get money. He had a mission. I kept thinking of Floyd lying in the muck, where he had suffered beyond our power to imagine. I would never have peace of mind if he remained there. He wanted the money to dig Floyd up and get him out of that cave. A couple of months later, he had it. Wow. All right, so back to Floyd. April 17th, 1925. Seven miners showed up to the scene. They began to dig. Within a week, they had arrived at Floyd. And this time, they approached from the other side of the rock formation. That way, they could remove the rock pinning Floyd's leg. They lifted him up from his tomb and laid him down on the fresh air above. April 26th, 1925. Floyd was set to rest in the family cemetery. A stalagmite had been set as a headstone to mark out his plot. And there he lay for... No, that's not actually where it ends. Okay, this is where it gets weird. Two years later, 1927. Times had been tough for the Collins. So Floyd's dad sold Sand Cave to a dentist named Dr. Harry B. Thomas for $10,000. Now, Homer begged him not to, because at the time, the government was starting to buy up tons of land in the area and turn it into national parks. They had to pay at a very competitive rate. But Lee was becoming a bit old and senile by this point. And frankly, it's doubtful that he cared about Homer or Floyd or anyone else for that matter. It's 100 years later, He's dead now. Let's call it even. So, the point is, in this Never land understood. sale with Thomas, Lee agreed to a very odd clause. And that clause said, everything on that property belongs to Thomas. And should he wish, for example, to exhume a dead body and re-embalm it and put it on display in something really tacky like a, I don't know, a glass coffin inside a cave, maybe, then that would be his prerogative. Lee signed, yes. And Thomas did exactly that. Oh, wow. Doyle made Floyd's corpse a tourist attraction. Of course. That's right. Two bits of gander. Come and wonder at the incredible dead it's man who Jesus. died in a cave. <laughs> but to add insult to injury, it worked. Visitors returned to Sand Cave to gawk morbidly at Floyd. Within a few months, Thomas had turned Lee's failing farm into a successful business. Now, the rest of Collins' family is horrified. They try a number of times to get Floyd returned to them, including through the legal system. But somehow, incredibly, the judge ruled in Thomas's favour. And so, there he lay for the next two years. The cave was not done with Floyd. 
one, two. Someone hatched a plan. Two years later, it's midnight, outside Sand Cave. Footsteps can be heard rustling through the brush. Now, we don't know who these two men are, but we know why they are here. To rob a grave. They sneak inside and clamber over the rocks in the darkness. Reaching Floyd's casket, they undo the latch and throw open the lid. There is his shriveled body. They throw him in a gunny sack and they race off into the night. For 800 yards, they carry dear Floyd like a couple of sweaty Santas about to deliver a really terrible Christmas present. Panting, out of breath, knowing that they're going to get caught any minute, they reach the Kentucky Green River hillside. There's no time with a one. Two, three, they launch his body towards the river, and Floyd goes sailing into the air, up, up, into the starlit beyond, and landing in a bush. Oh, God. The two men flee from the scene. Now, the next morning, Thomas notices that the body of Floyd is somewhat missing, and he contacts the authorities. The police come, they dust the casket for fingerprints, and bloodhounds are given Floyd's scent and let loose into the hillside. A few hours later, they manage to find him. He tangled up mess near the river, but this time with a leg missing, that same one that was trapped under the rock. So, despite his protest, it had been amputated. Neither the leg nor the culprits were ever found. And while it would be nice to think that this was some well-intentioned duo that did this out of the kindness of their hearts to free Floyd, it's much more likely that it was an act of vandalism because Floyd was simply too much of a hot tourist attraction. Yeah, probably. The following day, Floyd was cast back into the cave, back into his box, and it was covered by a metal lid, surrounded by a metal chain, and locked with a padlock. He was now more trapped than he had ever been. Yo, they like freaking dracula at him. <laughs> like, why? How is that a good tourist attraction? Like, I can at least, okay, people go and see horrific things all the time. There's lots of like, there's like, you know, the, the body farm. You can go and see that. Body works exhibit, you can go and see that. There's like the, there's like that weird museum that you can go and see, like the woman who was like frozen in soap. Like, you, there's weird stuff that you can see. You can see corpses pretty regularly. This is a boring tourist attraction. You go into a dark and dirty hole and look at a closed off box. It could be anything. That's the worst. It's just that's bad business. I bet, I hope that his business goes down the tubes now that you can't, now it's just a box and a hole. This cave had spun fate once again to make sure that its victim would never leave. And so, time passed. Floyd's body would continue to decay. The rot from his body would eventually rot the casket too, and every decade or so it would need to be replaced. A few years wow. later he was no longer on display, but even then he remained in that box for many more years. In 1961, Floyd's Cave was purchased by Mammoth Cave National Park, and it was closed to the public. There would be no more visitors. The entrance itself to Floyd's Cave was closed with a steel gate and bolted, then welded shut. But the Collins family never gave up objecting to Collins' body being left in the cave. And here is where the story ends. In 1989, at the Collins' request, the National Park Service ventured into Floyd's Cave, continuing on a more than 60-year tradition. A team of people worked over the course of several days to remove him from the cave. They took him out, left the cave, locked it behind them, and laid Floyd to rest at the Mammoth Cave Baptist Church Cemetery. After 64 years in Sand Cave, he is now finally at peace. The end. Thank you to Wendigoon as Floyd. If you don't let me out, I'm going to hire a gang of hitmen to come to your house and kill your family. Samito as Homer. The BTS meal McDonald's bag that has I'm McDonald's hungry. And BTS. Shut the fuck up <laughs> and eat some BTS, bro. Ordinary things as Miller. I'm enthusiastic, but would ultimately duck out the back exit. Rusty Cage as Gerald. 
Oh, well, hello there. Haven't seen y'all in a while. Welcome to my new home. And many kudos as burden. Hey, hey, buddy. You're right down there. I can. You uh, sleepy? Uh, I can. Oh. I can. Yeah. Can we get your coffee? Cold and little cup, I can't little cup of Joe. Uh, little cup of Joseph. I'm stuck. Little cup of Joseph from the little sleepy guy. Also, by the way, in case you're confused about the channels, this is how it works now. And do not forget, world of tanks, world, world of, tanks. of tanks. None of this would have happened if Use Floyd the code tank had mania because world the game is good. Okay. Wow. Um that was a lot. <laughs> that was that was a lot. And I really did think for for a little while there that it would be fine. I thought he would be able to get out. I don't know why I assumed that because like originally I was assuming Bra is dead. And then like they kept making me think he might not die. <sighs> Thought maybe he'd be okay. Uh, and then no. And then I felt bad because I made some jokes. <laughs> I made jokes about it. But he died. I mean, by now he'd be dead anyway. But, like, Jesus. I, I also don't understand why they never gave him water. It's like, yeah, I get you give him coffee, but, like, to like warm them up, but maybe start with tea. Tea is better for you and it can also warm you up, but you should also have definitely given him water. Also, I thought that like, you know, a human can't survive more than three days without water. And so like, if the water was like hitting him, like it looks like in the animation, the water was like hitting him on his forehead and like cooling behind him. It's like, you can't like, <laughs> How are you going to get any of that into you if you can barely, you can't move? Like, I don't know. I mean, I get people do some really dangerous, crazy stuff uh, in order to explore or to, to make money. And like I said, I get the exploration thing. Um, but... That just seems like a really, it seems like it was a foolish thing to do by himself. Like, you get somebody to to be on guard. Like, if he had gotten someone to to go with him, like, that's why, like, you're not supposed to do something like caving or scuba diving. You're not supposed to do stuff like that by yourself because it's really, really dangerous. And you can get yourself into a situation that you can't get out of. And if you've got someone with you, then they can help you get out of that situation. Also, I don't understand why he didn't try and make that squeeze area a little bigger. Like, I just kept thinking um, about Shawshank Redemption. And this is going to be some spoilers for Shawshank Redemption. So if you've not seen that movie, first of all, what are you doing? You should absolutely go and see that movie. Um, but we're doing some spoilers for Shawshank Redemption. Uh, spoilers will end when I go like this. So when I do that, you can come back and it's safe. But mute it if you don't want spoilers. So, okay, and so in Shawshank, he spends a really long time slowly carving out the tunnel of his cell, right? And it starts out, you know, he has to hide it behind a big old poster. So it's still like a really tight squeeze. But, like, he does, you know, you can make a, a wall like that big enough to to squeeze yourself through in a little bit more comfort. Um, Andy Dufresne was limited by the size of a poster. Uh, this guy wasn't, like, Collins wasn't limited by anything, except for that he wanted this to happen quickly, I guess. Um, so it's like, I don't understand why he didn't just take a little bit of extra time and make that hole bigger, especially again, because he was trying to make it a tourist attraction. Okay, so I'm not talking about Shawshank anymore. It's safe to come back. Um, but yeah, I do wish I understood a little bit more why he didn't make the hole a little bigger, um, especially if ultimately he wanted people to come into the cave. Because, um, I mean, I've, I've seen the results of splunking. Um, it's very muddy work. Uh, and you have to do some some crawling and uncomfortable contortion in order to make it happen. But like, if you're a 
I mean, I've done tourism caves before, and like they're cool. I've been to there was like a the Penn's Cave in the Nittany Mountains. I went to this one in Virginia, whose name I don't remember. Some kind of salt cave that was pretty cool. Like I've done some cool tourism caves type things, but there's places there's ways for you to get around like you I, the Nittany cave was like uh, a boat um which was cool like you were in a boat for most of it and then the other one was just like a walking tour but like there was so much you know if you want tourists to come you have to make it easy for a boring person who doesn't want to get dirty to do your thing <sighs> wow and i'd never heard of this like, this was not a a story that I knew anything about going into. Um, so I really did think for a little while that it might be possible they could get him out. And then everything just kept, you know. So it's sad. So again, tragedy. Go, kudos to his brother. Kudos to that journalist who... Uh, one hilariously just originally just interviewed him but then to like for him to keep trying over and over and over again to save this guy's life because he's one of four people who can fit down that tiny hole i just you know be careful folks i guess is the main takeaway don't do dangerous things alone make sure you've got someone with you Guess I'm a bad person to talk. I was in this like castle thing that I wasn't supposed to be in, and I had to sort of climb. Uh, it was not really a sheer rock formation, um, but it did kind of, kind of go straight down at one point, um, and then it was fine. Once I was in the castle, it was okay. Uh, but then I, when I tried to go back down, I realized that there were like I knew that it was possible to get up. Um, but I didn't quite realize the angles I would have to contort my body to in order to get back down. Um, I ended up having to kind of Spider-Man onto the rock and just hope that the rock was rough enough that my fingers wouldn't slip and I wouldn't fall and break my leg because I was alone and <laughs> nobody knew where I was well a few people kind of knew where I was but they would not be able to get to me um for several hours and I mean obviously I was fine but don't do don't do it like that if you're gonna do something kind of dangerous put yourself in a situation where returning is gonna be difficult just make sure you're with somebody and that is my PSA for the day and that is all um again I learned, I feel like I learned a lot in this video. I learned things about uh, Herbert Hoover that I had never learned before. Um, you know, so thank you for coming with me on this journey. I hope that uh, there weren't too many instances that I was an idiot and you needed to drink for that. So thank you for playing that game with me if you did. Um, I, again, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, to this channel, to our other channels. We have a few that we do different things on, so make sure that you're looking for those. Uh, if you can, uh, find it in your hearts and wallets to become a Patreon. We also really, really appreciate that. Um, if you're a member of the Patreon, our Patreon team, you can, you know, you can participate in polls. You can help decide what we're going to react to. You get unedited content. You get to see the full release of the video. Like, you get to, there's some fun perks to being a Patreon. So once again, thank you to everybody who watched this whole video. I know it was a long one. Um, thank you to everyone who likes, who comments. Um, we really appreciate every single one of you. So thanks again, and I will see you all in the next video. See ya. Mm -hmm.